So today we begin our study of Buddhism, and every study of Buddhism begins with the Buddha, which is a title given to a guy called Siddhartha Gautama of the Shakyamuni clan, born in northeastern India, way up there in the corner in the foothills of the Himalayas, in today what we call Nepal, born about 563 BCE, died about 483. And he was born into the Kshatra caste, that's the second caste down, the the military political caste, and his father was a military political leader. And so Siddhartha was to be raised in that tradition, but it didn't quite work out for a couple of reasons. He ended up becoming a spiritual teacher, and he taught for 45 years and traveled throughout the region and gathered a community of, of students and left behind this body of work that came to be known as Buddhism. And at the center of it all is this word Buddha, which comes from the Sanskrit word root uh, bud, to awaken. Every time you wake up, you bud. So it's a metaphor, isn't it? At the center of Buddhism, in plain, in plain English, Buddhism would be called awakenism. And I suppose the metaphor is drawing the distinction between sleep and wakefulness, or between a state of kind of ignorant, conditioned unconsciousness and wise, liberated, full consciousness. So coming right out of his Hindu roots, this Indian teacher took the essential insights of Vedanta that all is one, but there's a cloud of maya or illusion that prevents us from realizing our oneness and taught in a very grounded, down-to-earth way as being asleep or being awake. And as he taught and as he traveled, people often asked him, what are you? Are you a god? Are you an avatar, and, you know, an incarnation? Are you a prophet? Um, and he would just answer, I am awake, which I suppose implies that we are not. <laughs> but the good news in Buddhism is that all of us are Buddhas in waiting. All of us could experience the transformational shift in awareness, in, in consciousness, in understanding that the Buddha experienced. That's what the tradition teaches, and that's what we're going to explore. So there's also um, an interesting set of par parallels between Buddha and Jesus. And let's think about a couple of those. You know, both Jesus and Buddha were born into already ancient and well-established religious traditions. Jesus, of course, born into Judaism many, many, many centuries after Moses and Abraham. So Judaism is in the air in Jesus' world. That's where he gets his understanding of everything. And yet Jesus will go on, as the Gospels tell us anyway, to butt heads with the religious authorities of Jerusalem, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees. The, the story in the Gospels is not pretty that Jesus is often critical of their tight hold on Jewish life. And the same thing in the story of the Buddha. He is often critical of the Brahmins, you know, the highest caste in the Hindu world. I suppose his question to the Brahmins, the priests, would be something like this. So wait, you're telling me that all is Brahmanatman, all is one then what do I need you for? Ouch. What do I need priests for? Why should I pay you money to perform a ritual to connect me to the divine when your bedrock philosophy teaches me that all is already divine? And so both teachers are in their own traditions radicals, iconoclasts, thorns in the side of the authorities. That's an interesting thing to notice. And I'm afraid it's something you see over and over again in world religions, right? That these spiritual founders are often revolutionaries that are part of the undoing of the old order. And then give it a couple centuries, they become the centerpiece of a new order. That's always been the case, isn't it, isn't it true in political revolutions and in religious revolutions? There are some big differences between Jesus and Buddha. Jesus 
only taught for two and a half years before he was killed. Uh, Siddhartha had this long teaching career. Another big difference is Jesus was deified rather quickly. We see in the writings of Paul in the first century the claim that Jesus is divine. What an outrageous claim, especially in Paul's largely Jewish audience, that God would take corporeal form as a man. An idea unheard of in Islam and Judaism until Paul started to teach it and preach it. And of course, it became the central pillar of Christianity that Jesus is the incarnation of God. Well, all of that is missing in Buddhism, at least in original Buddhism. The Buddha, in fact, told his followers, don't worship me, be lamps unto yourselves. Let's avoid the whole devotion thing. Now, fast forward to later Buddhism, of course, it all came rushing back in. But initially, the Buddha taught a program of self-transformation. And that's where we're going to start our study of Buddhism. There's another nice, fun piece about this, and that is the story of the Buddha himself, his origin story. How did this kind of wealthy prince become such a profoundly influential spiritual teacher. Well, the story, of course, was covered over with layers and layers and layers of apocrypha, you know, legends and, and um, mythologies. But it's a beautiful and powerful tale of a transformational figure and his origin. So the story goes that, that Buddha, before he was born, existed in the celestial sphere and he orchestrated his own birth. He picked his mother and put himself in her to be born as a human being. And that's a nice twist on the old virgin birth or miraculous birth story, a ubiquitous archetypal idea. So many of these spiritual teachers come about through non-biological events, most famously, of course, Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Luke. But we have something very parallel here that, that Siddhartha comes through not from the ground up, but from the sky down. That's a common theme, isn't it, in these origin stories. And his father heard the prophecy that Siddhartha was going to be either a world redeemer and bring wisdom and enlightenment to the world, or a world ruler and bring uh, all of the empires together into one incredibly powerful kingdom. Well, his father, being a kshatra, being a political military guy, really favored that political option. And so he set about to create these secluded palaces where Siddhartha would grow up protected from the suffering of the world. He never got to see sickness or old age or death or anything. Everything inside the compound was pretty and young and beautiful. And it worked. Siddhartha, the story goes, grew up very worldly. You know, he loved his toys, he loved his pleasures. And so he was a worldly, materialistic, ambitious guy. But of course, you know, it's all gonna fall apart. He snuck out of the palace with the help of one of his servants one day, and they rode a wagon into town because Siddhartha was a curious young man. He wanted to see the world. And he saw what in the tradition is called the four passing sights. He saw an old man barely able to walk down the road. He saw a diseased man, sick, with all kinds of health challenges. He saw a funeral, the pallbearers carrying the corpse. And he asked his driver, what, what is that? What is that? What is that? And the driver tried to catch him up on what you and I already know. Yeah, old age is a thing. Yes, people get sick. And yes, people die. And the fourth thing that Siddhartha saw was a monk. He saw a, a wandering mendicant in his orange robe, shaved head, owning nothing but a bowl with which he received a little rice from people who were feeding him. And Siddhartha said to his driver, what is, what is that guy? And the driver said, that's a monk. And explained to him what a monk was. And Siddhartha said, hold on a minute. You mean to say... There are actually people who give all their money away on purpose, who aren't concerned with ambition or power or reputation. They spend all their time in contemplative prayer and meditation and in service. 
And the driver said, yeah, there's guys like that. There's women like that. And there's one right there. Now Siddhartha was completely shot. He went back to the palace. Everything that he had been investing his life in, pleasure, possessions, power, worldly ambition, he saw now all of that as fleeting, as impermanent, as without lasting value. He left the palace and spent six years in the forest, meditating, practicing yoga, Raja yoga particularly, studying with guru after guru, learning all of the wisdom of the philosophical traditions of India, Vedanta, all the wisdom of the Upanishads, Brahman, Atman, Maya, Karma, Dharma, Samsara, Moksha, Satchidananda, all, that's, all that great stuff. But it didn't get him where he wanted to go. And he grew increasingly ascetic or extreme in his self-mortifications. That didn't work either. So he stopped starving himself. He came back to his ordinary, healthy, middle path weight. And he sat down under the Bodhi tree and he began to meditate and he vowed not to get up until he had attained enlightenment. And now come the demons. The story goes that a particular demon called Mara came down to interfere with Siddhartha's progress. And Mara gave to Siddhartha three temptations to try to lure him away from the path of awakening. And if you're thinking, man, this is just like what happened to Jesus, you're right. 500 years later in the Gospels, we get the same story. It's again, an archetype. As Joseph Campbell points out, when our hero is about to go from one level of existence up to a higher level of existence, there's always what Joseph Campbell calls a threshold guardian, a demon, three riddles, three tests, some kind of challenge. And the threshold demon's job is to keep you out of the next stage because you're not ready. But when you pass the three tests, you prove your readiness. So the threshold demon is kind of doing you a favor because if you don't pass those tests, you aren't going to make it up ahead anyway. Well, we know what happens to Jesus. Satan appears to Jesus when he's fasting in the desert and gives him three temptations. Same thing happens to Siddhartha. In the Buddhist story, the first temptation is lust. Mara produces these two strippers and they go into their act right in front of this young man meditating under this tree. And, you know, Buddha grew up in a harem. It doesn't have the kind of impact on him that Mara thinks it might. First temptation's a fail. Second temptation, Mara says, hmm, I know, political power, which by the way is exactly the same temptation Jesus gets from Satan when Jesus is whisked to the top of a mountain by Satan. And Satan says, if you bow down to me, I will make you king of all you survey. And of course, Jesus and Siddhartha, they don't want political power. Although I bet Siddhartha's father would have really liked that second option. <laughs> it was the same thing. Mara said, if you give up this quest for an enlightenment, I'll make you ruler of the whole world. And that's a hard no from Jesus and Siddhartha. Then comes the third temptation. There are different versions of this in different stories. I'll go with this one. Buddha is about to awaken. And, 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 and the demon Mara says to, says to Siddhartha, look, I see you're pretty good at this and I see you're serious about this, fine. I'll tell you what, let's just get right to it. I will whisk you immediately, <laughs> fast track to your own moksha, your own satchitananda, your own samadhi, your own eternal celestial bliss beyond all forms. And Siddhartha says, no, I'm not in it for myself. I'm not looking for my bliss. I need to stay here in this body, in the world of embodied creatures. My job is not the alleviation of my own suffering. My job is the alleviation of the suffering of all sentient beings. And so I need to stay here in this embodied form. Now it's Mara's turn to be afraid. Now it's Mara's turn to flee. He's never met anyone with these kinds of powers and convictions and vision. 
and Mara flees, and it's at this point in the story when the Buddha awakens and becomes, properly speaking, the awakened one or the Buddha. Our next question is, what is awakening? And we'll get to that on the other side.